Hey everybody, my name is Brett Hall and uh, I'm a solutions architect for Cisco and today I want to talk to you a little bit about E911, otherwise known as Enhanced 911. So um, I get a lot of questions uh, from customers about E911 uh, since it's a growing requirement. Uh, there's a lot of concerns about um, how uh, the customers are going to meet uh, these growing requirements, especially as you have different kinds of endpoints that are deployed across the enterprise, whether it's hard IP phones or uh, mobile devices like 8821s or whether they're uh, soft clients uh, through, uh, through something like, like Jabber, uh, the customers have to meet the requirements for E911 and all these different kinds of endpoints. And since it's a fairly new topic, uh, the topic I think is a, is a fairly hard topic to understand. So today uh, my goal is just to help you understand uh, a little bit more about Cisco's architecture for E911 and uh, understand how to uh, uh, get it working and, uh, and how it works. So with that said, uh, let's try and just do a quick little level set on a few of the acronyms that um, you may be hearing as you read up on E911. Uh, the first is around ERL. And so ERL is central to a E911 solution. Uh, and an URL could be assigned to a physical location or it could be logical locations. So depending on what your organization has and what kind of building uh, you're trying to provide E911 support for, uh, you may have a quadrant of a building or you may have ERLs assigned to different floors of a building. You have a few different options here but uh, that's the first term that you should be familiar with. The second is ELIN, and uh, ELIN is your emergency location identification number. And um, what this is, is simply a 10 digit dialable number, uh, dialable number uh, that uh, are assigned to ERLs. And so uh, these ELINs are not ever assigned to endpoints themselves. These ELINs are assigned to ERLs and so the idea is a phone um, is inside an ERL, or many phones for that matter, and uh, anytime a phone dials 911 from that ERL location, uh, an ELIN gets associated with that phone. Um, and as the call is routed out to the PSTN and ultimately the, the PSAP, which is the public safety answering point, uh, the calling number is not the original calling number of your phone, the calling number is actually the, uh, the ELIN that you're part of. And that's how they understand what your geolocation is and uh, where they need to dispatch emergency services teams to, to respond to the emergency in the, the most rapid fashion. So I think I've just covered um, all these different terms here. Um, we'll, uh, we'll look at the call flow here next. And uh, hopefully this will help you understand a little bit more about what Cisco's architecture looks like and how we're able to use some of the intelligence in the call routing to make this happen. And so uh, if you're familiar with call flow at all, you, know, you understand that emergency responder probably shouldn't sit in line to uh, all the call flows. That wouldn't really be scalable and uh, it also wouldn't be very optimal. So the only time it really sits in line uh, between um, your, your servers and your gateways is in the event that someone calls 911. And the way this works is through something called calling search spaces and translation patterns and CTI route points. So if you have an endpoint that dials 911, um, that endpoint has a calling search space. And that calling search space has the ability to um, look inside uh, the, the DNs or the patterns of all different um, patterns that may be potential matches inside the, the partitions that are part of the calling search space. So in this case, we're going to have a translation pattern that are, that are very, very powerful. I mean, they can be used for many other use cases besides E911. But in this case, we're using the translation pattern to uh, almost emulate an endpoint. And the translation pattern is going to have a CSS, or a calling search space, of E911 to effectively route calls over to a CTI route point that is actually registered to emergency responder. 
So once a call arrives at the CTI route point that has a registration address of emergency responder, communications manager's job, at least in the first phase, is done. And uh, now emergency responder has controlled the call and it can do all of its manipulation here with the ELIN based on what ERL, the endpoint that dialed 911 was located from in the first place. After it does the ELIN assignment and, uh, and uh, does the on-site alerting, which we'll talk about here in a second, uh, it routes the call back to communications manager. Uh, it needs to do this because communication manager has all the different routing logic associated with it in order to get the call out to the PSTN and ultimately the, the PSAP. So we think about this um, at a high level. Uh, the E911 solution, its job is to A, route the call out to the PSAP so that emergency services can be dispatched out to the right location. B, uh, provide on-site notification so that personnel, whether it's security personnel or on-site emergency personnel or even just a management team, they can proactively help provide assistance to that caller that has dialed 911 and uh, also have the ability to escort emergency services teams to the right location once they arrive on scene. The third thing they have to do is uh, is provide callback information. And so that's really the next piece here. And this is something that people sometimes forget about is um, allowing the PSAP to have the ability to call back in the event that the caller dials 911, in the event that they pass out or, or maybe their, uh, their, their phone loses connection um, because there's, a, there's an issue with the building. It's very important to have that callback functionality. And so um, CER, along with communications manager, has the ability to do that. I kind of go through some of the call routing logic, but it, it boils down to um, translation patterns and CTI route points. And, uh, and uh, just looking into the history, uh, CER is able to cache the history, and it knows what directory number has uh, placed the 911 call, and uh, able to, um, you know, route the call back uh, for a certain amount of time to the right directory number that calls 911. So hopefully this helps you understand at a high level. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Cisco's GUI so that uh, we understand how this works. Okay, so um, I'm logged into Communications Manager. And uh, first, I'm going to start off by just showing you the different kinds of endpoints that I have registered to my communications manager server. So um, I have basically uh, all the endpoints I described earlier, the device types. I have 8865 hard phones, uh, IP phones. I have my mobile device, which is kind of simulating a mobile device that maybe your security team might have as a room around the building, checking on things, responding to uh, emergencies, and that can be used for on-site notifications. And then I also have my soft client, my, my Jabber client. And um, we'll talk about some of the implications here and uh, how we're able to use emergency responder to make sure 911 or E911 calls are always um, supported for any of these device types here in just a few seconds. So um, all these different devices have calling search spaces, as I discussed. And so what we're going to look at here first is a translation pattern, which is the very first place that uh, this 911 call gets routed to. If your uh, users are, are trained into dialing a, uh, a prefix, such as eight or nine to get an outside line. You may also want to have a translation pattern here to include that, just to make sure that, uh, that you always get an outbound line um, and effectively over to emergency responder. But this is the first place that uh, the E911 call lives. And so it's part of your internal enterprise partition. There's nothing special going on here. Uh, the, the next special thing is really 
uh, the idea that this 911 call, um, it has a calling search space. Uh, the E911 uh, calling uh, routing logic. So this, um, this translation pattern uh, has a calling search space that will route calls over to a CTI right, uh, route point that happens to be part of the E911 partition, which is part of this calling search space. So let's take a look at that uh, under device and CTI route point. And you can see here, this is the second place that the this E911 call gets routed to. So again, it's able to route uh, this call appropriately because the first place uh, was part of an internal partition, um, which is a separate partition from this. Otherwise, uh, if you didn't have this kind of hierarchy, you wouldn't be able to uh, route the call maybe in the most logical, easy to understand uh, way. So this um, CTI route point is, uh, is, like I said, it's part of the E911 partition and uh, it happens to be registered with the emergency responder. So um, this is how we are able to get the call over to emergency responder and so, uh, so it can do its job. Um, what you also see here is um, something that we're using um, for callback purposes, um, a secondary CTI route point, and um, this is this RPEL 913 thing. Um, we're not going to really talk about that too much in this video, but just realize that uh, this is a requirement, and um, if you have um, secondary subscribers, secondary CER subscribers, which I don't, uh, you would also have a secondary CTI route point, uh, such as 912 for failover purposes. So um, that's the CTI route point. Now let's uh, look over at emergency responder. And um, let me go ahead and log in. And so um, the first thing we're going to talk about is your on-site alerting. So emer emergency responder is pretty robust uh, in that it has the ability to do on-site notifications via phone and also on-site notifications via email. I don't happen to have an email server in my architecture, so I'm not uh, enabling email notifications, but, but many of you probably do have uh, email servers and uh, you can have um, an email alias that, that uh, gets sent out to uh, all the personnel or certain management personnel or security personnel as well. So um, I just have two on-site alerts configured. Um, the first one is for the security team and um, the alerting number is the same alerting number as my, my mobile device. So um, this is actually located under the ERL configuration. So that's the next place we're gonna go under ERL and then conventional ERL, which is uh, where most of you will spend your time configuring your ERLs and doing your ELIN assignments. Uh, as you can see here, I have four different ERLs assigned. I have uh, the um, very specific ERLs for my floors, and then I also have a default ERL, which is uh, somewhat of a catch-all ERL that can be used um, if um, your endpoints are not detected by some of the more traditional manners. And we'll talk more about that here in a second. So inside of my ERLs um, are a, a number of uh, things. So I have my translation patterns which are used to route the call out to the PSTN in the first place. And then I have my ELINs that are associated with, um, with this ERL. And so um, you can see here, I actually have the option of having more than one ELIN assigned to this ERL which is probably something to consider because in the event that you have a, um, a large issue in your organization, maybe a fire breaks out, there's a strong likelihood that more than one person will call 911. And uh, if that happens, um, we can support up to um, as many callbacks as you need, in this case two, uh, callbacks to the right personnel for, uh, for responding and getting situational awareness and things of that nature. Um, if if uh, someone makes a call today, it basically just round robins and uses those ERLs so they don't sit unused. And, um, and it's just a good idea to have. 
So the next thing I have here is um, my on-site alerting. And again, this is to uh, proactively alert somebody in the organization that a emergency call has been placed. Um, the ALI is something that we'll actually share with the PSAP that, um, that we're using. And again, this is your address. This is all the information that you might actually want to submit to the PSAP, including the location of the uh, caller. So in the event that um, your security team simply has no awareness at all about uh, the uh, 911 call being placed, uh, the PSAP should know that uh, the caller is in the first floor of the Cisco building. So this is this. Um, in order to kind of understand how these ERLs work with the endpoints and uh, especially the fault ERL, uh, I thought I would show you this handy ERL debug tool. So we'll go under um, tools and ERL debug tool. And you can see here, these are the endpoints that I showed you earlier that are registered to my communications manager. So starting at the bottom, uh, we have my 8821 phone, which is again, it's a roaming phone that only connects through wireless. It's assigned to the third floor ERL. And then I have my two hard phones that are assigned to um, both A, the first floor ERL, and the third floor ERL. And then I have my, um, my endpoint that is actually not assigned to any ERL that's actually falling under the default ERL. This is actually my Jabber client, and so um, there are ways to make sure your Jabber clients are associated to different ERLs, and um, I'll show you those here in a second. But this is a way to you know really kind of design your E911 solution in a way to make sure everything is covered, and then this tool can be used to proactively check to make sure you're compliant and that all your different endpoints or as many endpoints. Uh, as possible are configured to very specific ERLs. It's never a good idea to have all your endpoints uh, to fall under the default ERL. So um, now that we understand how ERLs are configured and ELINs are assigned, let's take a look at ERL membership. And so um, the way that um, this works, again, um, CER is able to uh, to know about your devices, in my case, uh, my switches, and it's able to periodically pull those switches using SNMP version 2 or SNMP v3. So uh, in my case, um, I've pulled these switches. I detected that my endpoint actually is plugged into port, uh, port 11 um, on the third floor and actually port 1 on, on the first floor. And so I have de you know, detailed information about um, the phone type, the IP address, the MAC address, and the extension here. And uh, I've kind of proactively already assigned the ERLs to every single switch port here in my organization. So at any point, if someone um, from your user community wants to unplug their phone and then, and then move it to a conference room or move it to their new uh, cubicle, uh, we can ensure that the ERL uh, is assigned and um, it's very accurate in, uh, in the way that uh, emergency dispatchers uh, locate the origination of the caller. Um, if we want to go ahead and change any of these ERL assignments, it's actually very straightforward. So um, you just click on, um, click on the port you want to change, uh, do a search for your ERLs. Uh, once you select it, you can just assign it, and uh, it's that easy. So as you add more and more switches to your architecture, to your E911 architecture, um, you can do that carte blanche by selecting the entire switch and assign uh, every single switch port to the ERL, or you can do it on an individual basis. So uh, the next option that we have uh, in uh, assigning ERLs is through subnet tracking. And so in this case I have two different subnets in my organization. I have a 192.168 subnet which is typically used for hard phones and then I have a 10.10.1 um, a network that's used for my mobile devices. And so um, if you recall 
uh, my hard phones were actually um, inside a Cisco first floor and Cisco third floor ERL. And so the, the process that CER takes is always the most specific process. It's always going to prefer uh, switch port tracking, and then after that, subnet tracking, and then after that, it's going to fall back to a, a default ERL. So um, if I want to go into the subnets here and discover which phones are associated with the subnet, I can just click on View Phones, and you can see my 8821 phone here. Um, if I didn't have switch port tracking, for example, I could still be good to go. I just wouldn't have very much specific information here uh, in my 8821 phones. And so um, that's how this works from an ERL membership perspective. The last piece, um, and this is really kind of at the protocol level, is, is how CER and Communications Manager uses JTAPI to actually change the calling party information, to change the ELIN. And so if we go under phone tracking and uh, communications manager, you can see here, um, I've already got my communications manager plugged in. I have this um, the CTI manager name of CER user. Um, so this is where you configure it in uh, emergency responder. If we go back to communications manager, this is not a regular end user. This is something called the application user. So. We'll go under application user and we'll find the CER user. And so, so first of all, he's got a you know traditional username, traditional password. Um, he is controlling devices, and so um, it's very important that he controls your CTI route points. Otherwise, um, we won't be able to um, effectively change the calling party information. And um, we also want to make sure he has the right group privileges. And so he has to have the CTI allow calling number modification enabled. So once we have all these di different things configured, now uh, we actually are changing the ELIN, we're changing the calling party ID, and we're making sure we're set up for callback purposes. The last piece that I'll point out is, um, is again, the uh, the, uh, the on-site notification capability. And again, um, that is in Communications Manager. Um, it's not necessarily the most intuitive place because you would think it would be under CTI route point. It actually exists under phones, but you can see here my CTI ports that are used for um, alerting the uh, on-site on security personnel that are carrying around this 8821 phone are configured here, and they're actually registered to emergency responder. So from a high level perspective, a configuration perspective, this is how we get calls routing uh, out to uh, emergency responder. Now after emergency responder is done changing the ELIN, the next piece is really uh, configuration of, um, of your call plan. And so you know, we, we configure the call plan here under call routing and then route hunt. We have the route pattern, route list, route group. But just quickly, I'll, um, I'll show you uh, and just validate with you the route plan report. There's really nothing special here. So if I just go under um, one certain translation pattern that I had set up in CER, you can see that um, the call and pattern is going to be 10911. We're actually going to strip the 10 off, and then, and then um, we're going to send it to a, a route list. We're going to... We're going to have our route list configured inside of our route group, and then um, our route group is going to point to a SIP trunk. So now that the call is out to the PSTN, um, we'll look at the last piece, which is really the on-site notifications. So what I'm going to do now is just kind of log out uh, of CER as an administrator, and I'm going to log in as a CER user. Again, someone that um, is emulating that security team, your, your front desk, your security personnel, the person that you want to alert and, and notify that a 911 call has been placed. And so hopefully um, your on-site personnel have access to this portal, and it's all role-based, right? You can, you can notice I'm, I'm logged in under, you know, as G. Williams, uh, as this, this security guy named George Williams. And here, um, I have all the different um, types of information that you might want if you're a security personnel. 
you had the ability to uh, hopefully notice what time the call was placed and so again this kind of portal is giving you the ability to uh, to have compliance right you're tracking when calls are being placed um, you're tracking the the directory number that placed the call you're tracking the username of the people that placed the call so again in the event that uh, you notice that um, as we wait for this thing to refresh in the event that um, someone like uh, like Brett Hall calls 911 uh, you could proactively alert my manager um, you can alert my loved ones my you know my wife my my son my daughter and let them know that maybe you know you should plan to meet you know Brett at the hospital um, and then you have the location information as well so um, some of the stuff, right? Some of the stuff does not have location information, and that's because it falls under the default URL. And so, this is why you always want to have as many specifics um, assigned to your endpoints as possible. So, um, hopefully, now you understand a little bit more about how Cisco's architecture works for E911. Hopefully, you know a little bit more about how to configure it with some of the call routing uh, logic and uh, parameters within communications manager leveraging uh, translation patterns and CTI route points and and um, what the uh, user's perspective might be um, from a monitoring and compliance perspective uh, when someone calls on site.